just coming here made me realize how much better an in-person conference still is. It just, it doesn't even compare. So it's been, it's been really great being here again. Hi everybody, my name is Kristen. I am a senior software engineer at Google. Uh, and today I'm gonna to be talking to you about how to build your first C++ automated refactoring tool using the libraries that ship as part of the Clang LLVM compiler. If your company uses MSBC or GCC, that's totally fine. As long as your code compiles with Clang, you will be able to use these tools. Now I'm, I'm gonna uh, make a request of the audience here that we hold questions until the end. I am sufficiently nervous as is, and I don't know if I could uh, handle interruptions. All of the slides will be numbered. If you'd like me to refer to the slide during the question and answer section, um, just remember the number in the back of your head. At the risk of being pedantic, we're gonna talk a little bit about what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, we're gonna discuss who I am and why I know a little bit about refactoring tools. Then we're gonna ground the discussion in the practical by talking about some concrete refactoring tool use cases. <laughs> then we're gonna do a crash course in all of the aspects of Clang that you need to know to write run one of these refactoring tools. And then, God help me, we are going to write a Clang tidy check live. And then, as I, as I promised before, we will have time at the end for special thanks and some questions. So, as I mentioned in my introduction, I am a senior software engineer at Google. I sit on the C++ core libraries team. I have sat on this team for the entirety of the duration of my tenure at Google. Um, on the C++ core libraries team, we like to think of ourselves as the stewards of the C++ portion of the code base. We strive to make it as readable, as extensible, as maintainable, as reliable, and as easy to use as possible. And in pursuit of those lofty ideals, we execute a lot of large-scale refactorings, and we build a lot of automated refactoring tools. Now, I think it'll be useful, as I mentioned before, to really ground this discussion in the practical to talk about some concrete use cases of these refactoring tools. So, one of the most obvious uh, use cases of these refactoring tools is consistent code formatting. You wanna make consistent style decisions across your code base. Uh, this is my mother and her aunt, who my grandmother dressed identically until they were early adolescents. Talk about consistent style decisions. Um, another use case is migrations and language updates. You might wanna take advantage of better paradigms available in new versions of the standard. So here we have some bad code on the left uh, with you know, raw pointers and naked calls to new and delete. And we can use refactoring tools to take advantage of std unique pointer and std make unique. Another use case for these refactoring tools is remediating, remediating issues, potential issues caused by theoretical library updates. So let me explain a little bit about what that means. This is a really fun example. So at Google, we love using the latest and greatest versions of the standard, but we don't just turn it on willy-nilly because that would be chaos. Uh, what we do is we do a test run where we turn on the new version of the language and we see what breaks. Theoretically, nothing should break, but it's code, so tons of stuff breaks. Uh, in C++ 17, this code is entirely fine. Uh, the compiler knows to call the overload of foo that takes a std vector of constant string, but the standard authors, in their infinite wisdom, introduced a std string view constructor that takes two const stars as parameters, and we all know that string literals decay to const star stars. So in C++ 20, this call suddenly becomes ambiguous, and this happens everywhere you have a container that has an initializer list constructor. So as you can imagine, Tons of our test targets broke. Um, and so we, re we wrote some refactoring tools to be explicit about the constructor call that we wanted. And you know we should be turning on C++20 tomorrow. Uh, knock on wood. <laughs> I'll have to check in with my team to see if that went well. Um, <laughs> so one of my favorite use cases of these refactoring tools is saving us from ourselves. We all know that C++ has tons of sharp edges. Some of your language experts might know some of these sharp edges, but you have a ton of non-expert C++ programmers at your company, and you're constantly onboarding new C++ programmers. You wanna be able to scale the knowledge of your experts 
as your company grows without necessarily having to scale the size of your expert team. And if we're not extremely proactive about preventing bad code from being committed into our code base, it will accumulate and cause technical debt. And if we're not proactive, on my team, we like to say, that's how you get ants. So how do we stop these inefficiencies, this an these anti-patterns and poor style choices, undefined behavior and other bugs from ruining the, pic the picnic that is our code base? Well, we build refactoring tools. What are these refactoring tools? Well, the most ubiquitous form of refactoring tool that we use is called the cling tidy. Uh, what is a cling tidy? Cling tidies are linters. They're static analysis tools for diagnosing and fixing typical programming errors. They run alongside your compilation process. They ship as part of the uh, Clang LLVM compiler. They are not tightly coupled to any specific IDE, but importantly, they are configurable to be used with most uh, IDEs. There is a litany of these existing Clang tidies. There are some for readability, some for performance and runtime, some for threading, some to prevent bugs, and of course, some for style, among you know, many other categories. In fact, there are over 300 of these existing Clang tidy checks that are available for you to use right now out of the box. <sighs> Let's actually try and use some. <laughs> Let's see if I can do this. Live example. OK, this is a contrived example, obviously. But can anybody see uh, some obvious issues with this code? You can just, you know, maybe I should have used, what? <laughs> you know what? I probably should have used a more, a less contrived example. I'll just tell you what I'm targeting in this, in this example. So in modern C++, we want to be explicit about which functions we're overriding so we don't accidentally instantiate new virtual function hierarchies in derived classes when we actually intended to override functions in our base classes. Uh, we don't want to use void parameters. That's a holdover from, from C style. And my favorite example here is the parameters to this std string constructor are actually swapped. The std string fill constructor takes the size first and the character argument second. So this is almost certainly a bug. It's such a common bug that there is actually a clang tidy specifically for it. So how do we run clang tidies? Well, there's a clang tidy executable. Hold on, I'm gonna bring this up on my command line because that's the safe thing, safe way to do it. So this is gonna take a little bit of time. How's everybody doing? How's your conference going? I'm really nervous. Um, <laughs> All right, cool. So uh, clean tidy actually tells us what our problems are and, and where they are in our code. And in some cases, they suggest uh, refactoring. But I'm busy. I don't have time to update my code myself. Clang, you clearly have an opinion on what I should be doing with it. Why don't you fix it? And we can tell Clang that we wanted to fix it just by using this fix flag. And again, it has to go through the, the, the whole compilation process again. I know this is dead air, which is really bad, but like, okay, great. So if we open our code example again, warning, example 1.cc has changed since editing started. You don't say, let's load the file. Okay, cool. And we've made all of the updates to our code that we wanted to. We have the override keyword, we got rid of the void parameter, and we swapped our string view our, sorry, our string, std string constructors. Std string constructor parameters. <laughs> okay, back to the presentation. So, there's a lot of existing clang tidies that you can use, but you're special, or your company is special, and you want your own. Well, you are in the right place. The rest of this talk is going to discuss how you can write your own clang tidy check. Let's look at the anatomy of a clang tidy really quickly. So there are two fundamental aspects to writing a clang tidy. The first aspect is identifying the piece of code that you want to change. That happens in this register matchers API. And the second part is actually refactoring the code that you've identified in the first part. Uh, that happens in this check API. Is check a terrible name for this API? Yes. Am I in charge of clang? No. So let's start by identifying the pieces of our code that we wish to update. And 
To do that, we have to take a huge step back and talk a little bit, a little bit about compilation in C++ in general. Nobody tells you how thirsty you get up here, wow. Sorry, I talk a lot and this is a lot of talking even for me, so Oof. bear with me. Okay, so this is, I am usually simplifying the compilation process for illustrative purposes here. I know there are gonna be compiler experts in the audience. Please don't hate me. Uh, compilation in C++ can roughly be broken down into four fundamental stages. We've got lexing, parsing, or the optimizer, and the assembler. These are colloquially known as the front end and the back end of the compiler. I'm getting hints from the audience that I need to slow down. <laughs> um, if you were working on an under the hood compiler optimization, so speeding up your code without actually changing it, uh, you would be working in the optimizer, but we are actually interested in textually transforming our code, so we are concerned with the front end of our compiler. So you start with some code, A plus B, this is a contrived example, please excuse me. Uh, that code will be consumed by the lexer, the lexer will produce a stream of tokens, that token stream will be consumed by the parser, and the parser will generate a semantic tree that will tell us how our tokens relate to each other programmatically. So you can see we went from like a code snippet to a information rich data structure that tells us that we have a binary operator with operands A and B. And you can imagine with actual code, this parse tree becomes, again, extremely information rich. And we can leverage that extremely information rich data structure to identify the specific aspects of our code that we want to identify based on its semantics. Now, I'm going to proactively address a question uh, that I know I'm going to get, which is, why aren't you just using a regular expression? And my response to this question is, go ahead and try it. Uh, there are so many ways to say the same thing in C++. Here are seven different ways to initialize an integer in C++ uh, that are syntactically very different, but semantically very, very similar, actually identical. Uh, here's another example. Try to write a regular expression that will tell you whether B is instantiating its own virtual function hierarchy or overriding a virtual function in A. It's just, you can't do it. You need some semantic context. Okay, the next question I'm gonna proactively address is why Clang? Why are we tying ourselves to this compiler infrastructure? And the answer to that question, like the answer to many other questions, is because C++ is hard, and it can't be parsed without semantic context, which means we cannot generate that syntax tree without a build system. And it just makes sense to leverage the existing infrastructure that Clang provides, as opposed to writing our own from scratch. I like doing less work. I don't know about y'all, but less work is better. So, that brings us to a discussion about the Clang abstract syntax tree. So what does the abstract syntax tree in Clang actually look like? Well, here is our contrived example as C++ code, and let's go on a field trip. Load, 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 okay. Let me uh, make this a little bit bigger. Not that, I mean, y'all get it. It's a very simple example. Uh, so we can use Compiler Explorer to visualize a ton of different aspects of our code, uh, including the abstract syntax tree. So what we're gonna do to see the abstract syntax tree here is add a new compiler. Of course, we're gonna use Clang. And then what we do here is we add an abstract syntax tree viewer. And I'm just gonna move this over so you can all get a better view. Um, and make that a little bit bigger. Okay, there are a couple of things about this tool that I really love. One is that it will dynamically update your AST as you update your code. So you can see I added a variable declaration here and we added a new uh, leaf, new branch in our abstract syntax tree. And I delete it and it goes away. Another thing that I love is as you uh, mouse over the nodes in your abstract syntax tree, the corresponding code snippet will be highlighted and vice versa. Okay, cool. So that's how you can visualize the abstract syntax tree on an arbitrary code snippet in Compiler Explorer. I'm like walking back and forth to my computer. 
Okay, so I showed you, oh, you know what? I forgot to do something. I just wanted to mention here, you can kind of see how the nodes in the abstract syntax tree correlate to our code snippet. So we've got a node for the translation unit declaration. We've got a node for the function declaration that is main. We've got a node for our compound statement. That's all of the statements in between those two curly braces. We've got a node for our, decl state, our declaration statement for A and our declaration statement for B. And we have one for our declaration statement for C. And you can see as part of this declaration statement, uh, we have a binary operator that has a reference to both A and B. All right, that's what I forgot. And we'll go back to presenting. Okay, cool. So I showed you the abstract syntax tree. And I showed you some of the nodes in that abstract syntax tree. But what are those nodes exactly? Well, they're either decals, statements, or types. These classes make up the base of the three inheritance hierarchies that constitute the vast majority of nodes in your abstract syntax tree. Now these inheritance hierarchy, oh, decals, statements, and types, oh my. <laughs> You'll have to forgive me, this is my first talk. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm gonna make some mistakes. <laughs> uh, these inheritance hierarchies, don't try to read this, it's for illustrative purposes only. Uh, these inheritance hierarchies can get pretty extensive. Um, here is the inheritance hierarchy for decal. We can zoom in on one of these nodes, and we can see that node itself has another extensive inheritance hierarchy associated with it. Okay, so that's a crash course in what the abstract syntax tree is. Now, how do we go about identifying which nodes in the syntax tree we care about? Well, for that, we use the AST matcher library. So the AST matchers, again, ship as part of the Clang LLVM compiler, and they come in three major flavors. We've got node matchers, narrowing matchers, and traversal matchers. These distinctions are somewhat arbitrary. Clang partitions them in this manner so they are optimally composable, but there's nothing stopping any of you from writing your own matcher that does all three of these things at once. Uh, we are going to discuss each of these matchers uh, right now, actually. So, node matchers. There's pretty much a one-to-one -one mapping of types in the inheritance hierarchies to AST matchers. The closer you are to the root of the inheritance hierarchy, the more things you're gonna match. So, decals, that's the base of our inheritance hierarchy for decals. We're gonna match all declarations in our code. We're gonna match the namespace declaration, function declarations, class declarations, uh, access specifier declarations, uh, member function declarations, and, and uh, member variable declarations. You know, traversing a little bit farther down in the inheritance hierarchy, uh, we can see that name decals will match fewer things. So we're matching the namespace declaration still, you know, our function declarations, our member variable declarations, but we've stopped matching our access specifier declarations because they don't have names. Going further down in the inheritance hierarchy, we have a matcher for function declarations. And now you can see we're still matching our free functions and our member functions. Getting even more specific, we have a matcher for uh, member function declarations, and now we are only matching our member function declarations. So, another important thing about uh, node matchers is that they are the only nodes, the only matchers that support bindings. Bindings are the means by which you register your node as being of interest for further processing in the check function, which as we all remember is where you're actually gonna perform the refactoring. So here you're gonna have two matches. For each match, you're gonna have one node bound with the ID my method decal. These IDs are arbitrary, you just need to be internally consistent. All right, the second type of abstract syntax tree matcher are nar is narrowing, are narrowing, are narrowing matchers. Uh, <laughs> narrowing matchers ask, what property does this node have? Some examples are, you know, is virtual, is private, has name, is const expert. So in this example here, uh, this matcher would only match the virtual function declaration in class A. Okay, traversal matchers are tricky. Uh, I like to think of them as just another name for narrowing matchers. You're still 
further constraining the ASD nodes that you want to match, but you happen to need to uh, run some analysis on a related node, so you need to traverse through your abstract syntax tree to some other you know, branch. Uh, let me try to illustrate this uh, with this code example. So say you're interested in call expressions, but you're only interested in call expressions uh, whose callee is a specific method declaration. So you need to look up here somewhere else in your code and therefore your abstract syntax tree uh, to do that analysis. And you do that with the callee matcher. So again, those are the trickiest. Uh, I also need to talk quickly about traversal methods. Traversal methods are important because it won't be immediately obvious what your AST is going to look like just based on your source code. So here we have a code snippet and a matcher. Field decal has type as string int. Field decal is just playing parlang for member variable. So you would kind of expect it just to match here. But what happens is it'll actually match uh, in both of these places as well. Because lambdas under the hood are functors, and the captured variables are actually member variables of that functor. This can be problematic if you're attempting to do a code transformation, because you think you'll just be updating you know, the int in uh, struct s, say you're doing like a migration to a different type, but you'll actually end up uh, generating uh, undesirable transformations. Uh, we have a way to remediate this issue, and see, that's correct. Uh, we have a way to remediate this issue uh, through traversal methods. So you can say that you only want to, you want to ignore everything that's not spelled in source, and that'll tell Clang that when it's running these matchers, only to match on things that explicitly correlate to something written in your source code. So now you'll only match this int here. Uh, don't try to read this again. Uh, all of this information about, like information about every single one of the uh, AST matchers that ship as part of Clang and the traversal methods are available on the AST matcher reference guide. This will be your best friend when you are writing matchers. There's a general dearth of documentation about the abstract syntax tree matchers, so there's not a lot of friendship competition, but it's a really valuable reference guide. Okay, so another contrived example I know, please forgive me, uh, let's talk about constructing a matcher expression, a full matcher expression. So these matcher expressions should generally kind of read like English sentences. So here's a sentence. We're looking for calls to a member function on a class named A and whose called function is named foo and whose first parameter is an integer. Okay, so we're gonna go through this step by step. We're looking for calls to a member function. So we have a CXX member call expression node matcher. On, we have an on traversal matcher. A class, we have another node matcher for class declarations. Named A, we have a narrowing matcher for uh, investigating the name of a type. And so an important thing to note about these node matchers is they take an arbitrary number of arguments. Those arguments will be additional matchers and those ma that argument list will be conjunctive. So it's basically a logical and. So we're adding a further constraint by adding another uh, parameter to our member call expression matcher, whose called function, again, call e and function decal, we, we saw those in the uh, traversal matcher example, is named foo, again, and, whose first parameter, so parameter at zero, is an integer. Okay, I know that was really fast. Uh, it should help that we are now going to build that matcher from scratch as a group. I'm really loving the field trip, field trip concept here. Okay. Can everybody see this? Oh, this is in the back. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I've got a couple of classes, and both of my classes have some method overloads. And in main, I call each of these methods, right? And I'm only interested in matching one specific call expression. So how do I get from you know, my source code here to a, an AST matcher that will match just a.foo taking an integer. So we do the same thing we did before where we add a compiler. And again, of course, it's x86 playing uh, trunk. 
And I could have had this all prepared, but I, I kind of thought it would be like neat going through it all together. So I wanted to click the buttons as part of the video. And what we're going to do is we're going to add a tool called Clang Query. So I think when the ASD matchers were first announced, the most requested feature was something that would let you build these matchers iteratively. Uh, and we do have that now, and it's called Clang Query. And it has been integrated into Compiler Explorer. And this is actually how we do all of our work on my team. Um, so uh, Compiler Explorer, so, so Clang Query, again, lets you build these matchers iteratively. Uh, and we're going to look at the AST matcher reference to figure out which matchers we're going to use. So I swear to God, this is what we do. We command F, and we said we were looking for a member expression. So member call, oh, that looks useful. CXX member call expression. OK. If you click on the matcher, it'll expand and give you some examples of what that matcher matches. So this looks like exactly what I want. So we're going to go back to Compiler Explorer. I'm just going to move this over here so I don't get uh, confused. M is just a command for match. So CXX member call expression. OK, cool. And now, and Clang Query will actually tell us which parts of our code we've matched. And you can see here that I've matched all six member calls, and I really want to further constrain my matcher. So we said that we wanted to only operate on things that came from class A. You're going to have to believe me here. I'm going a little bit fast. I will tell you. There is a traversal matcher for doing this exact thing on. And again, they expand, and they'll give you a lot of helpful examples. So in this case, this is exactly what I want. It looks like on has type, CXX record decal has name, and then in our case, it's going to be A. So on has type, CXX record decal has name A. OK, and now you can see I only have four matches, which is much better than where we started. But I still need to further constrain my matcher. So we're going to do that by adding arguments. Uh, and we said that what we're looking for is the called function has the name foo. So we're going to go back to our uh, matcher reference and see if we can find something for Kali. Oh, look, it exists. That's great. <laughs> uh, so we'll say. Uh, Kali is a function decal that has the name foo. OK, and we're almost there. We still have two matchers, or we still have two matches, and we only want one. So what we're going to do, we're going to further constrain our function declaration. Uh, and we're going to say, we're looking for something about a parameter. So oh, look, exactly what we want. Has parameter. Looks like it takes an integer and then another matcher. So it looks like it's got zero, has type. OK, great. So we're going to say has parameter uh, at zero, first parameter that has type is integer. There's an is integer matcher. I'm just, again, for expediency, I'm, I'm making some assumptions here. And, and now we've matched the specific code snippet that we were looking to identify in the first place, and none of the ones that we didn't want to identify, which is crucially important. Uh, I did this demo. Uh, as part of a lightning talk at CBP on C. And I borrowed somebody's computer to do it. And it turns out that English keyboards are different than American keyboards. So <laughs> if you go online and you see that talk, <laughs> just know that this demo went a lot better. Um, so we talked about binds. And I think it's important to discuss that really quickly here. Um, and we talked about how these node matchers take an arbitrary number of arguments. So we can have some redundant arguments that are just the base class matchers to do our bind, ex bind expression. So 6x member call expression statement, and we'll say foo call. We can do the same thing with all of our node matchers. So the record decal is a declaration that bind uh, a class a. I'm going to make sure I use all the same names as I do in the rest of my talk. Uh, and we can do the same thing with the function declaration, decal.bind uh, foo decal. OK, cool. And, and plain query will tell us which each of these, what each of these binds correlates to in our source code. OK, Whew. back to the talk. So we have a matcher. What do we do with it? Well, we stick it in that register matchers API. Uh, and that's pretty much it. 
And we make sure we have all of the relevant bind expressions that we care about. I have not included them in this slide, so please forgive me. Uh, and again, make sure we are using the correct traversal method, method which is ignore unless spelled in sort. Well, correct in most cases. Okay, so we have a node. So what, why do we care? Well, now we tell it that it's not good enough and it needs to be better, which brings us to the refactoring portion of our talk. So, in the refactoring portion of our talk, we'll talk about how we can actually update our code to uh, reflect the code transformations that, that we're, we intend to, to make. Um, so, we can pull out our bound nodes in our check function, right, using the get node as API. And here, you know, you can, you can produce diagnostics based on, sorry. <laughs> Uh, there is a rich assortment of, of member functions associated, associated with each of these types in the inheritance hierarchy. So if you would like to do further semantic analysis on your code, you can do so in this check function. Eventually, you're going to want to produce a diagnostic. Now, diagnostics can be entirely informational. Uh, you can just say like, hey, I'm calling your attention to this piece of code here. Your function's not awesome enough. Or diagnostics can be composed with fixit hints, which will actually perform the textual transformation for us. Uh, the LLVM maintainers have, you know, collated a very rich utility library. Uh, there is almost, our, almost always a utility API to generate a fixit hint uh, for any type of code transformation. Okay, so. At this point in our talk, we are ready to write our own plain tidy check from scratch. The first thing that we need though, when writing a plain tidy check, is something to write a plain tidy check for. Okay, this is a less contrived example. Uh, can anybody see something that might be problematic with this code? Yes, we are making a whole bunch of copies in this range for loop. And we don't want to do that. You know, we're C++ engineers, we want to avoid making copies. What we really want to do is stick an ampersand right there. And we know it's safe because the variable is declared const. Um, so, this is the biggest chunk of the, the live example. All right, I got another Tmux pane open. So I have pulled down the LLVM project and configured it. Uh, I'm obviously not going to do that live because for those of you who have built LLVM from scratch, you know it takes forever. Uh, <laughs> Clang tidies live in the Clang tools extra directory of LLVM, so you're going to you know navigate to Clang tidy the Clang tidy directory. Uh, there is this very convenient utility script to add a new check called add new check, very self-explanatory. Uh, I have already added this new check. Um, you tell it with which module you would like to associate your check with and what you want the name of your check to be. And then the Python script will generate the .h, the .cpp files for your check. It will generate the associated test file for your check and some handy documentation for your check as well. And it will also register your check with the build system. So, let's actually look at it. I just want to make sure I don't have anything open. Okay, performance, uh, example for CPP con check dot H. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, you can see the components of the claim tidy check that we talked about in the beginning of this discussion. We have our register matchers API and our check API. Let's look at the CC file. And here's the corresponding CC file. Now, uh, you know, the, the, the script will just generate some, some skeleton code for you. All this will do is append awesome to all your function declarations that don't already start with awesome. Uh, we obviously want to do something more interesting. And we remember that the first part of writing a matcher is writing in, or the first part of writing a cling tidy is writing an abstract index tree matcher. So let's do this live. Okay. 
this is the one that I want. No, this is the one that I want. I got a lot of Compiler Explorer tabs open. Okay, here is uh, the code snippet that we saw on our slides earlier. And we are looking to match this variable declaration for i. So let's go back to our ASC matcher reference. This is a uh, for range statement. There is a matcher for this. Fantastic. There's a matcher for pretty much everything at this point. Uh, CXX for range statement. I always get this one wrong. Okay, cool. But we'd like to further constrain this, right? We want to say something about the loop variable. Uh, there is a loop variable matcher. I got to close that guy. Loop variable or loop var? Has loop variable. Okay. So this is a really handy part of plain query. Uh, it will actually give you error messages when you're missing something from your matcher. So in this case, like, has loop variable expect some sort of argument? Um, so we're gonna say it's a variable declaration, uh, and it has a type, and what we're looking for is that it's const. So is const, that's a CXX method decal, is const expert, is const, is const qualified? That's what we want. Okay. I really hope this stuff works live. I, yes, okay, fantastic. So we're still matching, uh, we're still matching where, where we intend to match. And what we want to do is we want to bind this loop variable, right? So we're going to add this bind statement. We'll say loop var. Okay, perfect. And now you can see that loop var binds in our loop variable declaration. Okay, so what we do is, on my team is, like I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, we really copy and paste the ASD matcher from Compiler Explorer, and we put it straight into our code. That's not what I wanted. We gotta get rid of this match command. Okay, cool. And we bound the declaration to loop underscore var. So now we're gonna update our check function. Let's call this something more appropriate. And we're gonna get this node as a variable declaration. And we wanna make sure this unique ID matches. There we go. So, we're gonna get rid of all this. We wanna uh, warn on the loop variable declaration. We should say this variable should be a const reference. And I mentioned that Clang provides a rich assortment of utility functions so that you don't have to write your own from scratch. Uh, and there happens to be one. We're doing exactly what I want here, which is uh, do util fix it. Change variable decal to reference. Fantastic. Results.context. I know I'm glossing over a lot of stuff, but like, you know, this is, these are the fundamentals. Okay, cool. So that's it. That's our Clink ID check. Um, I would love to compile this. Uh, let me just control Z this out. I would love to compile this, but it does take a while, and it will run all of the Clink ID checks. So I will just show you the compile command, and so that you can run that later uh, on your own. So I'm going to go back to my LLVM directory. So what you're gonna wanna do is ninja, sorry, build the check Clang tools uh, project and that will run all of the associated tests uh, with your Clang tidy. I didn't go into writing tests, I just figured I didn't have enough time today, uh, but we can talk about it you know, after this discussion is over, uh, if anybody is interested. So, like I said, I promised I already compiled this. So let's look at a concrete example. Okay, here's our code. And we wanna add that ampersand so that we are uh, creating a const auto reference as opposed to uh, making a copy uh, of everything in our, in our array. So what we can do is run clean tidy. Let me see, again, examples. Uh, we're gonna run the performance checks because that's where I put our example for CPPCon. And there you have it. You can see that our cling tidy is suggesting that we add an ampersand um, as part of this variable declaration. 
And again, if we wanted to actually apply the fix, we could do so. So our code has been updated. Yay! <laughs> The demo, the live demo gods were with me, I guess. Um, okay, so once you get a handle for these claim tools, there's some really cool stuff that you can build. You're not constrained to just traditional claim tidies. It's a fantastic place to start, and it will accomplish 99% of the things that you want to do when it comes to refactoring your code. Uh, one of the projects that I worked on was a, a claim refactoring tool that would let API owners uh, annotate their deprecated APIs with a macro. And then the tooling would come along and actually textually inline their old API with the new version of their API. Uh, another thing that I'm working on right now is removing effectively dead but not statically provably dead code. So for example, if you know this flag is always true, you can replace this entire code snippet with a simple call to foo. And we can do that all uh, with Clang tools. OK. So what am I trying to say with this talk? What I'm trying to say with this talk is that it's a lot easier to build refactoring tools than you might have thought before this talk began. Uh, and I would really love to see people stop delaying language migrations and updates because they're quote unquote too costly. I would love to stop seeing people pulling their hair out trying to write regular expressions uh, to do these migrations. And I would really love for us to stop spending extremely valuable engineering resources and time uh, mitigating bugs in production or, or fixing code that can be done cheaper and more reliably by robots. Uh, I'd really like to acknowledge some people uh, at this point in time. Uh, first, firstly, the people who taught me about playing. Uh, Samuel Benzaquan actually was the original auth author of the AST Matcher library. Uh, so we all owe him a, a, an enormous debt of gratitude. Uh, Matthew Kulakundas, Andy Sofer, Eric Lee, Yitzhak Mandelbaum and Samira Bazazi are all on my team, and they have spent countless hours with me explaining the intricacies of Clang. Uh, I would also like to thank the people who told me to give this talk over and over and over and over again until I finally wrote it. Um, they are all in the audience today. Uh, Peter Muldoon, Daisy Holman, Dave Sankel, Brett Brown, and Amargo Leibold. Uh, for those of you who know me, I am very loud, and I like being the center of attention. So it seems natural that I would have given a talk uh, already, but I really required the support um, of these specific group of individuals to, to muster the courage and actually put my first talk together and stand in front of all of you and give it. So I, I, I really think they deserve a round of applause. OK. So I really hope you enjoyed that. If you didn't, I would like the last six weeks of my life back. Um, and as promised, uh, we have a lot of time for questions. I think we have a 15 full minutes. Um, I hope I can answer them. And actually, let me get some water, too, because it's harder than it looks, all right? Like, to all the speakers that have been doing this for years and years and years, I am extremely impressed with you. Mm. OK, question. OK, I don't, I don't know how the question queue runs. Just go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. It was awesome. Uh, I have two questions. So first is, uh, it's quite inconvenient to rebuild uh, QuantID. Do you know if Clang, uh, Clang support uh, or plan to release some plugin system? You know, I'm really spoiled because I work at Google, and we have this fantastic build system that does a ton of caching. Uh, so I don't know. This is actually the first time like I intentionally did all this on the command line because I wanted to be as illustrative as possible. Um, that is a great question. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. And follow-up follow question. How, how do you distribute a uh, new binary, new Clang ID binary across uh, all the projects and developers? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I anticipated this question, and I literally asked my team about it uh, so that I would have a cogent answer. Um, so what you need is like a compilations database so that you can like figure out which files are associated with the translation unit and which compile flags uh, you need. And then Clang has APIs to take that information and, and run Clang tools 
Um, so you do need to build some infrastructure to like, if you have a, like a particularly large code base to maybe do like a map reduce type thing. Um, but then there are libraries inside of Clang that will let you, uh, you know, pull information down and run the Clang tidies on top of existing source code um, in, in a programmatic manner, not like on the command line, if that makes sense. I can show them to you after, after the talks or the questions are over. I, uh, great talk. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the infrastructure of just like when your Clang Tidy checks are run, or they run like outside of a build process. Is there some like Git hooks type thing? I know Google doesn't use Git, but uh, <laughs> you know, like, can you can you talk about like when a, t a Tidy is introduced, saying this is the Google standard and we're going to uh, adhere to it? How is it enforced, and how do you get your developers up to date on it? Yeah. Okay. So. Let me make sure I understand this question. Um, are you asking, like, at what point in the like the build of your code the the Clang tidies will run? Yeah. So I, I wrote my new library foo. I'm committing it to the Google yeah. code base. And how do I make sure it's up to standard? I, I've done this on my own yeah. company that I've worked yeah. at, but it's it's like okay, I have it on my machine. I need to make sure all the other developers who are working on it have the same thing. And yeah. Okay. So let me let me let me do my best to answer this question. Um, so we on the C++ core libraries team, we maintain like a, a batch job that runs these clang tidies regularly. So people will say, I have an idea for a new clang tidy. And then somebody on my team will review it and will canary it and make sure that there aren't a lot of false positives because that's a big problem with these clang tidies. Um, and then if we like it and we're like, okay, there, this is, this is a good clang tidy, we'll promote it to production. And then we actually are like, we are the ones that push all of those changes out to everybody else in the company. Got it. So it's not like uh, each individual commit is reviewed and like like before it's commit the client. We have that as run. well. Okay. Yeah. So we have analyzers that will run as part of like our code review system. Um, and like I again, I, I believe that the client tidies run like again, I, I'm pretty sure run alongside your build. Um, and and we have you know infrastructure to surface those client tidy warnings in critique. In, which is our like our version of Git. Um, really interestingly, like you can configure almost any IDE to surface these clang tidy warnings. Um, so like my vimrc surfaces clang tidy warnings. Um, it, you can integrate it with VS Code too. So like if you want to make sure that your code is you know performant and idiomatic and stuff before it's committed, you can do it at the IDE level. But again, Google also has uh, a, a stopgap check before it's committed to make sure that new code is, you know, adheres to all of our style guides and standards. That's great. I'm going to find you about that VIM. Okay. Hi. Um, do you unit test the Clang tidies? And if yes, what do you use to do? Yes, we do test the Clang tidies. Um, there is infrastructure. I'm like debating whether or not I should try to show it. How much time do I have? I have 11 minutes, right? Okay. I feel like it's probably better to be under time than over time. OK. Um, let me just make sure I'm in the right. I think this is, uh, this is no, actually, this is in tests. Uh, tests. OK, so you playing tiny. So, OK. I'm sorry that I'm just like poking around. Like, we can talk after too. Um, Vim performance example for cppcon.cpp. Um, I probably could have incorporated this into my talk. Uh, I, I use this to actually validate that the Clang Tidy that I wrote did the correct thing. Um, the add new check will generate this file for you. Um, and I don't know exactly what you would call check underscore fixes, uh, maybe a tag. Um, there's also one for check messages, but basically you write some code that you expect to match and have a transformation. And some code, like you can see on line 19, that you don't expect to have a transformation. And then when you build the check claim tools project, it will run all of the tests for you. And it will tell you whether or not, like, you know, your test passed. This is Clang standard. Yeah. It's all, this is all, like, I literally just pulled this all down from LLVM. Like, this is nothing Google specific. I did that intentionally. Thanks. Did, did that answer the question? OK, perfect. Hi there. Um, yeah, thanks. This is a, a really daunting topic to, to get started, but you, you really gave me the feeling that I could now pick this yeah, up and, and get started. So that, that, that is awesome. 
Um, one question. So there's a lot of things that people might want to do uh, when it comes to refactoring. Um, can you give any advice? Like, what, what are the, the kinds of checks in refactoring that, that this tool is particularly good at? Mm. And what are things that I maybe would not want to use it for? Honestly, I think you're only constrained by your familiarity with the, with the libraries and your imagination. Like, writing code to prune branches was really daunting and not something I would have thought I could do with Clang Tidy, but it turns out it actually does it pretty well. Um, there are other paradigms available as part of these libraries. Like there's this thing called an AST traverser, and it actually gives you the authority over how uh, the syntax tree is traversed, and you can do some really cool stuff with that. Um, in general, I would say good checks have low false positive rates. Like, like this traditional, this, this kind of check, something with low false positive rates, just because like, depending on the size of, your, size of your code base, like if we run this tool over all of Google 3 and it has a 95% uh, success rate, like a 5% failure rate is still pretty high when we, when we think about the hundreds of thousands of translation units we have. Um, especially, you know, given that if we do a refactor and like part of it doesn't compile, like we can't push in any of those, any of those edits. So, Low false positive rates, I guess, is the TLDR. You know, minus all the rambling, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, yeah, thank you very much. Mm. I am so sorry, you have just been standing over there patiently. Oh, that's all right. Um, so it seems like you're using the abs abstract syntax tree for the, you know, try to get into this stuff. Can, it, can these tools be aware enough of white space that you can use it for more kind of Clang format e tasks than Clang tidy? Yes, so a lot of the times we jump into the lexer when we're doing these kinds of, um, this kind of stuff. And like that's, that's when we do stuff with like macros or, or comments or white space. Um, and like again, that's all part of the Clang, Clang libraries. And I can show you like where you can find those, those APIs if, you, if you're interested. In, find me after. Okay. I'm done. <laughs> done with questions. Thanks. Mm. Okay. I, like I said, this is the first time I've done this. I don't know how it works. Uh, so my question is, I, there are a couple of common refactoring operations. Mm. For example, I think you give an example of like renaming an API. And I, I do that very often, right? But each time I do it, I don't want to kind of rewrite Crank AST um, again and actually like add it to the chip. So are you aware of like any tools that allow me to do these kind of common refactoring operation that kind of wrap around and try to tidy. Say, say what type of refactoring, like a rename? Yeah, those like common refactoring operations. Uh, yeah, that's why I built the C++ inliner. So I really want to open source it, but uh, <laughs> I need to make a business argument, I guess, to do so. We were writing like similar refactoring tools over and over and over again. We're doing type alias migrations or class renames or function deprecations, and so we sat down and we actually wrote a general purpose refactoring tool so that no one would have to write that kind of you know, refactoring tool ever again. Um, so you can, uh, it necessitates like a, a relatively deep understanding of what's available as part of the Clang libraries, but it's possible. I don't know of anything that ships out of the box with Clang, I'm, I'm sorry, except for this, the, the Clang tidy checks that already exist. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, they told me not to bounce because they told me it would make a lot of noise, and it does. I am not tall enough for this. <laughs> um, uh, I, more of a design question, mm -hmm. but I was curious about how you go about thinking about the distinction between what is a requirement versus what is a suggestion, and then especially with the suggestions, how you get adoption of those suggestions. Hmm. Okay, um, so I would, the low false positive rate, like if you're not confident that the suggestion is gonna be accurate or that the refactor will be accurate, like servicing it as a suggestion is a good idea. Uh, the other times where you want suggestions as opposed to actual fix-its uh, are when the compiler can't possibly understand what your intention is. So there's a readability check for magic numbers, um, but the compiler doesn't know what you wanna name, name your variables. But it will suggest to you like, hey, this code looks kind of potentially dubious. You might wanna consider making this a named constant. Um, so I guess, Things that, re that require developer input, you, you want to be suggestions because you, you don't want to just have the robots make, make the decision for them. And, and things that are like 
pretty localized and very typical, I would suggest having actual like code transformations as part of the tidy. I think. I think that's a. Does that, does that answer the question? Okay. I think this was a great and very practical talk. Uh, I have a question about upstreaming checks, like upstreaming, the yeah. community. Mm -hmm. um, so, is the best place to look for stuff uh, is only like in the official LLVM repository, or are there other places where I might find arcane checks that might only interest my community or where it might mm. contribute to? I think what happens most of the time um, is that each company will have its own like repository of, of checks. Like we have a ton of checks at Google that are not upstream. Um, so I don't know of anywhere else you might find them. That would probably be like a quick Google search. Uh, but I don't know of anything off the top of my head. I'm just going to stop going back and forth. I'm just going to turn over here. Smart choice. <laughs> um, are there any interactive tools? Like, for example, if you have a check that produces a moderately high false positive rate and you want to be able to say, yes, apply it here, don't apply it here, yes, apply it there, you know, could it? No, but that would be fantastic. And we've talked a lot about this at, like, on my team about how really, like, how great that would be. But I, I don't think there's anything like that that exists currently. There are some teams that are working on some similar things based on like AST analysis, but again, it's, it's not anything that you can just download out of the box. Apologies. Hi, is there a Clang Tidy that will find uh, my function that is maybe 2,000 lines long and six nested for loops and identify that as a target for uh, refactoring? You know, if, it, if there isn't one, you could write one. All right. Because uh, it, it, it would be pretty, it would be reasonable. Like you can do like line la length analysis and all that kind of stuff okay. with, with these libraries. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hey, so, <clears throat> pardon me. My team has been inching towards doing this, <clears throat> not inching, running towards doing this recently. <laughs> um, we, we actually added something and got it uh, uh, accepted to LVM8 uh, okay. in the next version. Um, do you have any thoughts about what we should not go do with this? Like what, what thing did you think was a great idea and you tried it and it turned out to be horrible? God, I don't know if I can come up with something off the top of my head. Um, we will talk after because like my, uh, one of my teammates, Yitzhak, is actually the, one of the people that reviews the LLVM upstream patches. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to ask him this question as soon as this talk is over. Cool. Thanks. I'm sorry. I'm not fantastic at thinking. I'm <laughs> thinking on my feet. <laughs> oh, tuple defined struct, but I don't know enough about that project. Oh, replacing macros is hard. Yeah. Ah, okay. Thanks, Daisy. Yeah, the example is pretty nice, and I realize it uses one of the existing fix me's. Uh, what if you know I don't find anything in Clan that can, I can already use and need to, I guess, write my own suggestion or fix me? how easy or hard it is. It's exactly as easy as it was in this talk. Right. Uh, if you want to upstream it, that's like a, an additional, um, it's like an, arguably an onerous process, but like that's an additional process. I think that you can like, you can configure your own Clang stuff to use checks that you write without having to upstream them. I think we do that at Google, right? We must, because we have a ton of Clang checks. So you can like hack your, your tool chain to run your own custom Clang tidies uh, without having to bother upstreaming them, although I would encourage you to upstream them just because you probably have a problem that a lot of people have. But yeah. Okay. I know this is going to be a question of a lot of things besides just like the Clang tooling, um, you know, what source control and CI CD stuff you use, but how sort of challenging is it to build tooling that would enforce these types of checks on new code, but not existing code? New code, but not existing code. Um, we, so we have that. Uh, so it takes like my team actively updating the existing code to do these migrations. Um, but we do run, again, as part of our code submission process, we'll do like a compilation check and we'll, we'll validate that there are no clean tidy warnings. Um, so we actually do that at, at Google. Um, we should probably, Daisy, you, you, me, Daisy, and I can have a, a longer conversation about how we do that. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but, well, I don't know exactly how it's implemented, I guess. <laughs> I know it exists. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. 
Hi, great talk. Thank you very much. Do you know, uh, do you have similar functionality for the other languages of Google? This is obviously a very useful type. Yes, yes. Was, so Java has this. Uh, it's called error prone. Um, and they use it to do similar migrations. The, um, the, the inliner that, that we built, uh, we actually built it uh, in parallel with the Java developers. Um, obviously, we couldn't share any of the, the uh, code editing infrastructure, but we did share like the code submission functionality. So we did this, this project kind of in tandem. Um, I don't know exactly how it works for Go, uh, but we do, have, we do have this stuff for Java. And we have it for Go, I just don't know how it works or what it's called. How much time do we have? We're probably past the end of our time at this point. I think it's like 547. Okay, well, let's, yeah. do, let's do the last two questions and then we'll call it a day. Cool. Um, thank you very much. It was an awesome talk. It's, I, I had no idea that all of this stuff was this integrated in a Compiler Explorer. At this Compiler point. Explorer like, is great. It's, it's pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, one question though, so about like the, the matchers and the kind of stuff that you can do. Like one thing that I'm wondering about here is, is there any access to anything that looks like type traits or something like that? Like say that I want to know, like, you know, is this type like trivially destructible or yes. something? And, oh those, really, okay. Those are matchers, yeah. Like the AST matcher reference has, uh, has all the available matchers and like if it doesn't exist, it's actually not that hard to write your own matcher. Um, but yeah, that, that, those matchers exist. Okay, thank you. Very inspiring. So, how volatile are the hierarchies in the LLVM? So, like when you upgrade the compiler, how much do you need to change in your checks to match the new hierarchies? Uh, I don't know if I'm the person to ask this question. Um, I think they're pretty consistent. I, I've never had to remediate an issue caused, like, in terms of like, okay, this matcher no longer exists. I've never had to do with that. So I would say it's pretty consistent. And like, we have some very old clean tidy checks that it like, you know, have been around for a long time. So yeah. All right. I will release all of you. Have a good dinner.